Okay, good morning. Really nice to have you all here. Hope your Wednesday is going well. We are down to the next to last day of Chem 222 lecture, which is pretty exciting, a little freaky at the same time, but uh, anyway, just wanted to say thank you. It's really cool to have you all here. Um, for those of you with lab on Friday, <coughs> We will do problem set six on Friday, last problem set. We'll take the last quiz, quiz six, which is over the stuff from problem set six, and we'll do the last lab, kinetics part two lab. And for those of you on Wednesday, of course, it just translate everything to Wednesday. But anyway, that's pretty cool. Um, one announcement, and we'll talk more about this on Friday, <clears throat> but this lab that we're gonna do this week is actually due a week from today. And for those of you with a Friday lab, the lab will actually be due a week from today in this room at 8.45, and it has to do with the lecture final schedule and stuff like that. We'll talk more about that during lab, but I just wanted you to know this lab has an unusual time compared to the other labs we've done. Uh, any questions, any stuff? Okay, <clears throat> on Monday, I made some pretty far-reaching comments about his future of the universe and blah, blah, blah. So let's get into what I was babbling. I mean, talking about at, actually, at that moment. And in this example on Monday, we talked about the formation of an element. This is deuterium. Hydrogen is normally one proton and one neutron, so it would be one, one H, but this is actually deuterium, heavy hydrogen, they sometimes call it. And we're making deuterium from a proton and a neutron, okay? And what we end up finding at the end is when you add the proton and the neutron masses together, this is the number you get. And a deuterium, when, you, when people have studied it, this is the mass of a deuterium. And you can definitely see that those numbers are not the same. And why I made a big deal of it is that in Chem 221, when we balanced equations, Oh, got to balance, no fractions, blah, blah, blah. You know, all that jazz, right? I made a big deal of it. And here, mass is not conserved. Like the mass that goes in is not the same as the mass that goes out. And at first, this is a freaky kind of a concept for chemistry, right? Because atoms going in, atoms coming out, Lavoisier, all this kind of jazz. All right, law of mass action. Well, we're going to see that there's a little bit more to law of conservation of mass than we've talked about. So this is the change in mass. The delta is always final minus initial. And you can see it's a negative mass. All right, we've lost mass in, upon making deuterium. So what happened is Einstein realized that, aha, <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Get all choked up here. I'm so excited. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, back to your regular schedule program. A change in mass is related to a change in energy. You've maybe heard about or seen E equals mc squared. Well, this is what we're going to use right now. Now, a joule is a kilogram meters squared per second squared. And when you're using Einstein's equation, we have to take the grams per mole. On the last slide, it was 10 to the minus three grams per mole. You have to take the grams per mole and turn it into a kilogram per mole, all right? So the 10 to the minus three number on the previous slide becomes a 10 to the minus six when you divide by a thousand. But then you have kilograms, and this is the speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth, use four sig figs speed of light squared, then you end up with kilograms times meters squared per second squared. And that's what a joule is. It's a derived SI unit. Excuse me. So you plug these numbers in and you end up with this number, which is a negative number. It's a negative joules per mole. Now let's just stop there for a second. A negative energy, is that exothermic or endothermic? Excellent. XO and big time XO. All right, this is a negative number, so that means that energy is being released upon making deuterium. And if you think about this number, 10 to the 11th, all right, remember that 10 to the third is a thousand, 10 to the sixth is a million. This is a huge amount of energy, all right? Like all the reactions we've looked at in chemistry so far, all right, sodium with water, hydrochloric acid with sodium hydroxide, you know, these are powerful reactions, but they're nowhere near this magnitude. 
This is orders of magnitude higher than all of those reactions that we've looked at so far. Um, so let's continue on here. We're going to take the joules per mole. We're going to turn it into a kilojoules per mole because that's the standard way of doing things. And we're also going to turn the joules into kilojoules, all right? Um, oh, the other thing we're going to do here, binding energy, it's the symbol E sub B. And binding energy is literally defined as the opposite of the energy change when you make the matter from the protons and neutrons. So we're making it positive, all right? And we end up with 2.15 times 10 to the 8th kilojoules per mole. And that's the energy that you get out upon making deuterium. And again, this number is just massive. Most of the other reactions we've looked at in this class have been about 10 to the third or so kilojoules per mole, the biggest ones. And this is 10 to the eighth, so many, many times larger. And why I think this is kind of cool is it rationalizes why the universe has elements, all right? I mean, elements don't just form because they want to, all right? There has to be a reason. And the reason is, is you get out so much energy when you make an atom. If you are an investment banker, and I work at a community college, I have no idea what money is all about. But anyway, if you're an investment banker, you invest your money and you want money out at the end, all right? Well, this is the money slash energy that you get out for making an element. And it's, it's a lot of energy, all right? So when the Big Bang happened, you ended up with all kinds of energy running around and some protons and stuff. Well, atoms started to form right away because you get a lot of energy out when you start making the atoms, which is pretty cool. So this kind of calculation justifies why elements form at all, all right? Like, why aren't we just protons, electrons, neutrons running around? Well, you get a lot of energy out and stuff, which is good for you and me, because we have DNA in our bodies, we drink liquids and et cetera, et cetera. Questions? Okay, so this is the binding energy per mole. On the next slide, I'm gonna show you a graph which is binding energy per nucleon, per mole of nucleons. Now a nucleon is just a particle in the nucleus. So in this example, we had one proton and one neutron. We had two nucleons. So if you divide this number by two, this is the value you get, and it's the value that you, uh, energy you get out uh, in terms of energy per mole of nucleons. So scientists have got numbers like this for all the different isotopes, or a lot of them anyway, that are known. And this graph right here uh, is the result of that. So earlier we saw deuterium, which is down here, was 1.08 something, 10 to the eighth, whatever, all right? So that's the value for deuterium. And you can see from this graph, we're looking here at binding energy versus the mass number, because these are isotopes. A really interesting curve happens right here, all right? And you can see how deuterium is actually pretty low. Like here's lithium-7, oxygen-18. Here's uh, helium-4, kind of an anomaly over there. But anyway, I'm going to focus here in a little bit on iron-56. And iron-56 is literally the high point of this graph. So all the other elements, in theory, can combine, and they want to be more like iron-56. And they will use what we're going to call here in a little bit fusion, all right? On the other hand, the elements that are bigger than iron-56, uranium, krypton, whatever, all right, they can use something we'll talk about in a little bit called fission to undergo reactions and become more like iron-56. But iron-56 is literally the king of the hill, all right? It's the top point. And if you make iron-56, you can't make any other elements and get more energy out. And there's going to be ramifications for that here. Questions on that? Okay. <clears throat> if you study astronomy and the solar cycle, which is the birth and death of stars, um, all the stars basically have to stop when you get to iron 56, all right? Because even with the power of a sun, you can't make other elements uh, once you get to iron 56. It's literally the top part. Suns essentially use fusion, by the way. 
But anyway, that's for astronomy more than here. But anyway, iron 56, even the power of the sun, you can't make anything past iron 56. Now, <clears throat> elements less than iron, <clears throat> excuse me, will use something called fusion, we'll talk about that in a little bit, to become more like iron 56. And elements that are larger than 56 will undergo fission to become more like iron 56. Everybody wants to be like iron 56. But I'd like to do a thought experiment with you for just a second. Let's say that the whole world, the whole universe, all right, is iron 56. <clears throat> You're never going to have any more reactions past that because energetically, that's the high point. It's always going to be endothermic to make, say, cobalt or whatever from iron or hydrogen or something like that. So literally, the end of the universe, is that pretty dramatic or what? I brought that back on. The end of the universe, in theory, will happen when basically everything is iron 56, because no more reactions, all right? No more CO2 in the air, because it's iron, all right? No more uranium and nuclear reactions, because it's iron, all right? And so you can argue from a thermodynamic standpoint that the whole universe will essentially stop when you get to iron 56, which is pretty crazy. Now, <clears throat> those kind of statements are always pretty freaky, and I kind of, as an optimist, feel bad even making them. So I want to remind everybody about our friend kinetics, <laughs> all right? Now, kinetics, the K word. All reactions have an energy of activation to go from reactants to products. And even though iron 56 would be so low, so anything else to make it, you'd get a lot of energy out. The energy of activation to get through that hump is huge, all right? Fusing these elements or fissioning them elements to smaller things is, has a massive, massive uh, energy of activation. So if you don't think from this lecture that, oh my gosh, the world's going to end, we're all going to be iron, you know, and stuff like that. No, no, no. The kinetics of the reactions are so incredible. It's not going to happen, <laughs> all right? It's not going to happen for billions and billions, I would even say maybe trillions of years. All right, so don't take this as like some kind of doomsday thing because it's so far off in the future. I mean, <laughs> this is one of those things you have to really use science fiction to a point because it's so far out. So kinetics and stuff makes those reactions incredibly difficult. All right, it's not going to happen like tomorrow. All right, it's going to be millions upon maybe even billions of years into the future. So kinetics really does make this happen. So all of our DNA and caffeine and all these things are safe. Caffeine. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Sometimes it's the small things we have to be thankful for even. I forget about it, but <clears throat> yeah, put, put, fill in your own blank, you know, so. If you say cocaine, just say no. No, I'm just joking. Seriously, whatever kind of chemical, sugar, Gummy burn, gummy bears. All right, I guess I kind of get a little crazy there. Questions on, okay. So here's a question you might see, and it says, which of the following of these nuclei has the highest binding energy per nucleon? And here's these different values. Now, if you have Google, all right, you can absolutely look the binding energies up. But remembering that iron 56 is the high point, all right, nothing's higher than iron. You would like to get the element, of course, which is closest to iron. So if you look on the periodic table, well, there's iron number 26. And just two doors to the right is a nickel, all right? So we would argue that nickel is the most, has the highest binding energy per nucleon. Now, because this is what I can do in my safety of my office, I guess, I looked up the different binding energies of these isotopes. And these are what's called a mega electron volt, which is related to a joule, all right? And nickel was definitely the highest, all right? Here's helium, here's this thorium, here's this lithium. Nickel is the highest of the binding. But again, the punchline is, if you see a question like this, you want the atom which is closest to iron 56. Questions? 
All right, so fusion and fission are processes that happen on a nuclear scale that are both important. They're important not only as a scientist, as a scientist but it's also important as we're gonna see for our humanity, all right, for making energy. And I'm gonna talk about my favorite one first, definitely, which is fusion. Now, fusion is taking two smaller elements and essentially smashing them together so you end up making something a little bit bigger, all right? Sometimes there'll be an extra piece left over, stuff like that. Fusion is really exciting to me because it's a very clean energy source, all right? And there's some real exciting advancements going on with fusion. So if you have the right kind of nuclei, they're small, and it's usually hydrogen, helium, maybe lithium, stuff like that, and you smash them together, all right, and it's not easy to do, but if you do, you can get a lot of energy out, all right? And this is the energy out that is equivalent to the energy that comes out from other reactions. It's a huge number, but you know, we use like hydroelectric power in the Northwest because we get energy out from the water moving forward, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is another kind of a source of energy, but it's very clean, all right? Like, let's say that there was a problem with our fusion plant and we started to have, you know, problems. Well, you shut it off, all right? You'll have some hydrogen, you'll have some helium, so no smoking because hydrogen is flammable and helium would be pretty crazy, but there's no dangerous things with fusion, all right? It's uh, pretty easy, I would argue, to just stop the reaction, let everything chill out, and you're good to go. Now, because fusion has such a high energy of activation, and that's again the energy to go from reactants to products, you do need plasma. Now, we've talked a lot in Chem 222 about solids, liquids, and gases, but there is a fourth phase of matter too called plasma. And plasma is something that you do need usually for fusion, all the things I've seen so far. Plasma, believe it or not, is actually the most common phase of matter in the universe. <laughs> but here in Mountain View Community College, solids, liquids, and gases are definitely more common. So we'll talk a little bit about plasma and stuff and what's going on. Um, <clears throat> literally, plasma is another state of matter, all right? So in addition to solids, liquids, and gases, which we're all using right now or have used this morning, uh, plasma is a fourth state. And they describe it as type of a fluid, but it's electrically conductive. And apparently, when it's done right, you can make plasma flow, all right? I have seen a plasma generator, but I've never actually, quote unquote, seen plasma except on videos. Um, you need super strong magnets and electric fields to contain it, and it's incredibly warm too, so you have to be very careful with stuff. Now again, what's really strange is that here on the Earth, you know, solids, liquids, gases all around us, but in the universe, most of the matter is actually plasma. Uh, the sun is essentially a big plasma source, all right? And of course, the sun has by far more mass than anything else in the solar system. So, so there's only these occasional islands where the other phases of matter exist, which is kind of crazy. So, um, this is a graph just showing some sources of plasma. Of course, all the stars, big, the solar cores and stuff like that, that's cool. If you saw the eclipse in 2017 and you saw the little corona around it, that corona was a plasma ejection, which is kind of neat. Um, more practical, uh, lightning is apparently a plasma source. Uh, certain types of fluorescent lights actually use um, a type of a plasma inside them, which is pretty crazy. And then my students, uh, so my students think that there's plasma in a grape. They're cutting a grape in half and they're putting it in a microwave and a, uh, match head. with a match head. Yes. 
So uh, these, were, these were two brothers that were in my class, and they said, hey, we can make plasma in, my, in our home. I'm like, <laughs> well, anyway, they made this video. And I was like, oh, come on. But I couldn't explain it either. So I looked up online, like this plasma in your microwave thing. And again, they cut a grape in half. They put a match head in there, and they cover it. And this incredible light source comes around. And I wasn't totally unconvinced uh, that there was something wrong there. I think it, maybe it was. I Honestly, I don't know. So this is at least an unknown source of energy, and it could be plasma. Some people uh, claim that it is. So this is something, if you're interested, might be fun to look into more. But anyway, they made it what they claim is plasma, and I couldn't disprove it. So, uh, And it's kind of a fun video. According to science, that means it's true. <laughs> No, it means it hasn't been disproven yet, G. So, <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, there is some evidence that says that possibly, all right, but I, uh, we don't have plasma detectors and stuff like that here. So, but maybe some of you in the future. Anyway, plasma is important for fu for fusion. And when you're using plasma, you can't just like have a bottle of it to show around. So this is an example of what's called a tokamak reactor. And a tokamak reactor is used in a lot of the fusion generators and stuff that are happening. And a tokamak is essentially like a donut. And the donut has really strong magnets and heating capacities and stuff like that. And the energy from the plasma is what allows to overcome the energy of activation. So it allows these things to fuse together and stuff and make uh, these things happen, which is really cool. Um, you can apparently walk in tokamak reactors and stuff. There's a big one down in the San Francisco area. There's also a big one in Germany that they're working on. But it's pretty cool kind of stuff. Chi, you had a question, sorry. I was going to say it's different plasma than like what's in the blood. Uh, so far, there's only one type of plasma, but there are different constituents in the plasma. Yeah, so you can have like a hydrogen plasma or a lithium plasma, stuff like that. It's one phase, just like there's one solid, you know, one liquid, but the pieces inside could totally be different. You bet. Yeah, good call. Good question. Sorry, I was back. So. Oh. So this is for some kind of thing they were trying to get funding for a fusion project, which is great. Um, and it is a, a whole interesting thing. This is another in, inside of the tokamak. Here's a person right there, so you can see the relative sizes. On the outside, just incredible electronics and stuff to make this kind of stuff happen. But again, this is a real phenomenon. <clears throat> This is the plasma stream. Last year, both in uh, the UK and in California, they did experiments where more energy came out than they put in. And that's really cool, because if you could do that, then you could start generating all this plasma and use it for con electricity, conventional electricity, and stuff like that. So it's starting to happen, man. Um, <clears throat> this is a megajoule, <clears throat> which is just a million joules and stuff put in. A kilowatt hour, if you've heard of it, is related to the megajoules. So, so I'm hoping, like I said, that one day, you know, our energy won't come from these other nefarious sources and they'll start to use fusion because fusion would be a really clean energy source. And if you get more energy out than you put in, cool for school. In the nuclear fission of uranium-235, a neutron collides with a uranium atom, causing it to fission into two smaller nuclei. On the average, three neutrons are emitted for every U-235 atom that divides. When people talk about nuclear power, they're usually referring to nuclear fission. And one thing I want to make very clear is that there's fusion and there's fission. Now, fission is the classic uh, nuclear reactor that you see like in The Simpsons and stuff like that, all right? And in a fission reaction, a bigger atom is split up into smaller atoms. 
and in the process, a lot of energy is created. Now, to get this party started, if you will, you have to have something to break up the bigger atoms. And it's usually a, what they call a neutron trigger, which is just a neutron being shot into the nuclear like a bullet, all right? And it breaks up the bigger atoms into smaller atoms. So this is uranium-235. It's broken up here into krypton, a barium, and more neutrons, all right? And again, in the process, you make energy. The energy can be used to heat the water, which makes the turbines run, which makes electricity, blah, blah, blah. This blue light is Chernikov radiation. And it only happens when you have a lot of energy and electrons move through the water. Uh, you should be in protective gear if you watch this live. Uh, that's why this video, I'm like, dude. But anyway, I'm hoping the remote camera was keeping them safe. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's a neat phenomena that happens when you have fission, uh, stuff like that. Uh, it's not something you see with fusion, so. If the mass of U-235 is less than the critical mass, no chain reaction will result. Most of the neutrons will escape to the surroundings. If the mass is critical, most of the neutrons will be captured by other U-235 atoms and an uncontrollable chain reaction will occur. This is the explosion of a thermonuclear bomb. So in fission, you have to have more energy out than you put in, like the same thing with fusion, all right? And so what they do is they'll shoot a neutron into a big one and it splits up. But one reaction creates like three neutrons and those neutrons go on and create more energy. And more neutrons create more reactions, blah, blah, blah. So you have to control the reaction and they'll have some kind of a neutron absorber. Uh, sometimes it's boron, there's different kind of elements and stuff they use. <clears throat> if you don't have a way to control the neutrons, that that's when things get really crazy, and that's the ultimate fear of the fission bomb, uh, fission uh, reactions, is that they'll just be uncontrolled and you'll start having then nuclear problems. Uh, again, here's kind of the reaction. These control rods are basically neutron absorbers, and they kind of control it, and then you essentially have then water that then that circulates, creates the turbines, which makes electricity and stuff like that. There's about, uh, when I looked this up a few years ago, there's about 400 nuclear fission plants in the world. Um, there's many countries. The United States used to have a lot more, and we still have some, definitely. France is apparently quite the leader in fission, and of course, China is looking into it, as always. But the problem with fission that fusion doesn't have is that you're always left with products, waste products. And a lot of these products are super radioactive. And you have to have some way to contain them, sometimes reuse them, but there's gonna be some kind of some kind of waste at the end. And you can't just go throwing it in the landfill, all right? Because this stuff will get into groundwater and jazz like that. So that's the real issue with fission, definitely. Located in the nuclear core of a fission reactor are fuel rods, moderator and coolant fluid, and control rods. Each fuel rod contains tiny pellets of uranium dioxide. In these hundreds of fuel rods, fission occurs, producing an average of 2.5 neutrons per fission reaction. The fuel rods are surrounded by water, which acts as a moderator by colliding with the neutrons and slowing them to a low thermal level. The water absorbs the thermal energy, which is used to drive a steam turbine to generate electricity. The low energy neutrons enter other fuel rods and collide with uranium-235 nuclei, creating additional fission chain reactions and the release of more neutrons. The amount of low energy neutrons present is regulated by control rods made of boron, which are very effective at absorbing neutrons. These rods are raised out of or lowered into the core as needed to sustain the chain reaction at the desired level. In the 60s and 70s, uh, nuclear fission was seen as the energy of the future, all right? Oregon had a nuclear power plant, a Trojan plant, which was kind of out by Rainier, Oregon, kind of. And uh, anyway, it was seen as really cool. <clears throat> but there were some problem events all right, and I put that in quotes because I'll let you figure this out. Um, the first big one was in Pennsylvania in 1979, Three Mile Island, and <clears throat> there was quite the scare there. They thought for a while it was going to melt down and all kinds of bad stuff. 
uh, people are able to control it. You've probably heard of Chernobyl, all right? Uh, Chernobyl was in the Ukraine, which was part of Russia at the time. And in 1986, that was really bad news. There's a really wild HBO documentary, which is based on real life events, uh, that talks about it. And I do recommend it if it's interesting. I watched that and I'm just terrified as a scientist. But anyway, uh, Fukushima happened after an earthquake in Japan, and it created a whole area that was for a long time inhospitable. I find this one really interesting, though, because they're studying the effects of radiation on the environment and stuff uh, from it. And it's, it's been pretty interesting. They're opening up, I guess, areas, I, I don't know. But really relevant to us is Hanford, Washington, which is over in southeastern Washington, right on the Columbia. And Hanford is where they've done a lot of research into making some of the heavier elements, I believe plutonium, stuff like that. They have a lot of waste in Hanford. And there's been problems with leaks into the atmosphere. They leaked a whole bunch of iodine and strontium at different times. Uh, people worry that their radioactive uh, sledge farms is gonna sleek, sink into the Columbia, which would be into the water table and of course we are downriver of them so that would affect us here in Gresham and Portland and stuff so um, <clears throat> that's why I think and I hope that fusion will be an awesome replacement for it one day so then it'll be clean energy blah, blah, blah. anyway one hero that hasn't been recognized enough, in my opinion, in this area, her name is Lise Mittner, and one of the elements was actually named after her. But she, along with these other people, were one of the people that really talked about fission and how it works out in 1938. Now, uh, and one of the elements was named after her. Um, just like Marie Curie, she was forced to work in a basement. Um, she never got a Nobel Prize, but Otto Hahn did. Um, Lise Mittner was a pacifist. She wouldn't take up sides against Nazi Germany. This was the right around the time, or the Allies. And so she was kind of seen as an anomaly, all right? Um, but I think she really does deserve a lot more uh, respect and uh, recognition for some of her work and stuff. So, so anyway, Element 109, she's cool. Even some everyday objects contain radioactive sources. Let's see how a Geiger counter responds to these items. First, we look at the background reading. Listen for the rate of the counter clicks and observe the meter response. Smoke detectors use a shielded americium 241 source. Smoke detectors should never be disassembled as has been shown here for demonstration purposes. Now we observe the response of the Geiger counter to a lantern mantle. Lantern mantles can be obtained at any sporting goods store. This brightly colored orange fiesta ware plate contains uranium oxide in the glaze. The radiation level is high enough to be dangerous if exposure is prolonged. The blue fiesta ware plate has a non-radioactive glaze. A Geiger counter is a way that people measure radiation. And how Geiger counter works is the radiation ionizes the air. And if you have ions, then you can have electricity being conducted. So they're pretty simple. All right, you can buy handheld ones and really fancy ones and stuff. Um, <clears throat> and so most things don't have much of a signal. But remember that around us all the time, there is some radiation. So you turn a Geiger counter on, it starts clicking. It doesn't mean you should run for the hills or something. It's a normal process that happens. One really interesting thing, I was once in Walport, Oregon, and I was in this kind of secondhand store, and uh, my son and wife were looking at this wonderful orange fiesta ware, and I'm like, put that down, we're out of the store right now, because the orange fiesta ware from the 60s and 70s used a radioactive uranium uh, as part of the pigment, and you don't really want to be around that and stuff. So anyway, if you see orange fiesta ware, get out of there. <laughs> Um, we're not going to talk about radiation and health so much, but I did want to show you a couple of the ways that people measure how radiation affects us. Um, the Ronchin, which gets another capital R, we've seen R so much this term, uh, is a way, way that uh, is one way that radiation is measured. So an usual chest extra X-ray is about 0.1 Ronchins. Um, there's also the Ronchin equivalent for man or person, which is REM. That's another one that's used. Uh, one of the ones I always like, because I like Marie Curie, is the Curie. Woohoo! A Curie has just a quantity of an isotope, and it undergoes 3.7 times 10 to the 10th DPS. 
Now, DPS stands for disintegrations per second or decompositions per second, as some people will call. A DPS comes from an atom. So if this, if you had one atom disintegrating, you would have one DPS. So a Curie means you've got 10 to the 10th atoms, essentially, breaking down per second. When you have 10 to the 23rd of anything running around, having a 10 to the 10 DPS is not a big deal, which is both good and bad, of course. Uh, there's RADS, <clears throat> all right, RADS is related to joules, so that's best for what we're doing. If you have an exposure of 450 RAD, that's the LD50 for humans. Does anybody know what LD50 is? Lethal dose 50% of the time. So if all of us had 450 RAD exposure right now, half of us would be dead. <laughs> this is one of the biological things that kind of freaks me out as someone that always studied dead things. However, it's just good to know and stuff that they've figured out, you know, how to do this and jazz like that. Okay, <clears throat> so here's a quick thing that's worth a little eye clicker question. And it says, we should try to live as radiation free as possible, okay? So let's look at these questions. A, yes, all radiation is bad. It's best to have no radiation exposure at all. Mm -hmm. B, yes, but we gather some radiation exposure naturally due to geological processes in the Earth from space. So some radiation exposure is natural and normal. Of course, that's the right one. You're always gonna have radiation around you. We have radiation around us right now. You have an x-ray, you're gonna have some, all right? You don't wanna go putting yourself, you know, in the in the kind of radiation place. Uh, you know, the government's not out to get us and stuff like that. Maybe you wanna be like Peter Parker or the Hulk or something like that, but Bruce, Hulk was Bruce Banner, by the way. Anyway, uh, some radiation is totally normal. All right, and don't think that anything less than that. You just don't want to go crazy with it, right? So, questions? Yeah? So I can't be like Peter Parker? I would not recommend trying. <laughs> <laughs> and gee, that shows that I like you, because if I did like it, I'd say, yeah, sure, go for I it. I have a lot of spiders. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. This is just, this class is just no fun. <laughs> Seriously. Dream, man. Yeah, well, there's always a non-zero probability of anything happening. Other questions? Nuclear transformations is another area where this is really cool. And the way that they keep getting more and more elements discovered is through these kind of processes. So in a nuclear transformation, you're essentially smashing smaller elements in together, trying to make bigger ones. But instead of getting to get energy out or something like that, like confusion, they're trying to detect these really low, uh, really low uh, quality quantity of uh, atoms and stuff. Now, a linear accelerator and a cyclotron are the two main things that they use to try and make these heavier ones. But all of them basically, somehow they have to wind up an element and then they, pow, they fire it into some kind of a target. And then they have elaborate ways to measure what comes out when you smash the element into the target. And again, having like a single atom is something that they can sometimes detect, which I just find fascinating. Some of the newest and heaviest elements, this is what they have. They've discovered like 10 atoms of some of them and they were able to figure out enough that they, could, they knew it was an actual element, which is crazy. Um, this is an example of the biggest one of these particle accelerators. This is in Switzerland, CERN. All right, and this circle kind of shows like where the thing is. And it's all underground and there's a lot of helium and stuff like that. It's many miles long. And again, the whole purpose of this is just to smash these smaller nuclei together, trying to make bigger ones. And it's not an easy process, all right? To have really small atoms smash into other small atoms takes a lot of luck, all right? And definitely some skill. Uh, but they have been able to make some pretty interesting things through. So when you think about all the elements on the periodic table, all right, <clears throat> um, astronomers and chemists will sometimes work together because if everything wants to be like iron, how do we have anything past iron? 
And it's just amazing and stuff. They feel that a lot of supernova from stars created the heavier elements, all right? So for example, there's actually quite a bit of molybdenum in our bodies, well, relatively speaking, anyway. And all of that molybdenum had to come not just from a normal star, but from a supernova, all right? And the supernova ended up. If you have a gold ring or a silver necklace, all right, supernovas, it's just incredible and stuff. So this is a huge area, white dwarves exploding, merging neutron stars. I mean, whoa. But uh, anyway, uh, it is pretty neat to think about where they, where they got to, so. Um, this is a cool term I learned just recently. A kilonova is when two neutron stars collide, all right? And they feel that a lot of these post-iron elements might come from these kilonovas, these neutron stars colliding. Now, that just is so far, it just blows my mind as both a scientist and as a person into science fiction. But anyway, it is kind of interesting to see how they're trying to rationalize the elements that we take to them. A made MC, a fine cat. With the serendipitous VOB. This teaching is one of this lab's main themes. It's the place that introduced me to physics of beams. They accelerate nuclei, the protons and neutrons at the centers of atoms. We call them nuclei. Protons define the element, it's chemistry. Neutron numbers affect elements with subtlety. They define the isotopes. And with effort, they hope to make some that no one's ever seen before in that scope. So you move the elements from the periodic table, but this other version highlights isotopes that are stable. The isotopes we know are on a dying track. And and if for stands, I thought it looked pretty wet. But as you get away from that stable nucleus slime, there's radioactive isotopes we don't usually find on Earth. Because the nuclei prefer to decay into more stable isotopes by tossing particles away before they can. The teams here check out their dynamics, measure masses and lifetimes, and study their mechanics. Mechanics, their mechanics. They're building after it with mysteries to solve like what reactors drive stars. And how do they evolve the strong force by nuclear level? We still can't say exactly why some are stable while others decay. A more powerful machine can push the frontier. The physicists here, they get nuclear, nuclear, nuclear. So let's say you were making a new kind of nucleus in effort, a fun facility that's long been discussed. The starting atoms, they're just ordinary stable isotopes. They're easier to store and carry. You strip off their electrons for a charged state. Basic through electric fields made to accelerate. Then you send them into something. We call it the target. 5% of your nuclei are going to really hit it. Those that do will be different from your starting crew. They've lost protons and neutrons, or maybe gained a few. All kinds of fragments have just been created. And so you put them through a magnet, they can get them separated. If it's got lots of protons, it takes an inside curve, but more neutrons tend to drag it for an outside swerve. You filter out the isotopes you don't want in the stream, and we'll not. You've got a rare isotope beam. And to put your nucleus on the nuclear map, you'll then measure it in a detector or trap. This facility is for research and to teach, so that you can be more than just a figure of speech. Speech, your speech, your speech. Your speech, your speech, your speech. This video actually goes on for quite a ways, but I love the energy. And this is one of the places where they're actively looking at making new elements. And there's a lot of information in here, but they take essentially stable nuclei, stable isotopes, all right, and they essentially ionize it. And then they get it really wrapped around. It depends on the system, but they want to make it go fast, have lots of energy. And they smash it into the target. Some of the target stuff is garbage, but some of it, all right, they get bigger, like two things smashing together because one and that's what they're after and they look for it and they use a super powerful mass spectrometer which is just a way to measure out the different isotopes and they can find really small amounts of them which is really fun so anyway if this is anything you're interested in uh, Michigan State University is pretty cool for this kind of stuff so Uh, after graduating from uh, UCLA with a major in chemistry in 1934, I went to uh, Berkeley to obtain my PhD in chemistry uh, in 1937. And uh, then a few years later, I became involved uh, in the uh, research to synthesize and identify the uh, so-called trans-uranium elements. 
uranium has the atomic number 92 and is the heaviest naturally occurring element. And uh, what we uh, did was go on to produce by nuclear bombardment uh, elements with atomic numbers greater than 92. Uh, for example, 93, 94, 95, 96, and so forth. The most important one, of course, is the element with the atomic number 94, plutonium, which has the uh, fissionable isotope uh, that uh, is used uh, in atomic energy and was used in the atomic bomb that uh, brought an end to uh, World War II uh, when it was used at Nagasaki. Uh, we named uh, plutonium after the planet Pluto, just like uranium had been named after Uranus and neptunium after Neptune. Uh, we could have uh, given it the name Plutium after the root Pluto, but we like Plutonium better. And we should have given it the symbol PL, but we like PU better. And uh, we thought maybe we would be criticized for giving it that kind of a symbol. Um, we went on, after I moved to Chicago to work on the chemical processes for the separation of Plutonium, for its use in the atomic bomb to the metallurgical laboratory of the University of Chicago. And here uh, we went on to discover the next two elements with the atomic numbers 95 and 96. And in order to do this, we had to predict the chemical properties using the periodic table, but the form of the periodic table at that time was wrong. And I changed it and uh, created the, the actinite concept for placing the heaviest elements in the periodic table. Uh, for this, I received the Nobel Prize in 1951. Uh, so that shows you how easy it is to uh, uh, do work that would uh, give you a Nobel Prize. One of the uh, elements uh, that uh, interests me uh, very much uh, that we synthesized uh, is the element with the atomic number 106, which has been given the name by the discoverers, of which I am one, uh, Seaborgium, with the symbol SG. Uh, the uh, Commission on Nomenclature of Inorganic Chemistry of the uh, International Union of Purified Chemistry that have to approve uh, this name uh, rejected it because I'm still alive and uh, they could prove it but uh, there was such a universal uh, disapproval of that action uh, uh, that it now looks like the name Seaborgium for uh, element 106 is going to uh, remain and of course I'm very pleased about that this is a very high honor I think it's a greater honor than e even receiving the uh, uh, Nobel Prize because it, uh, it, it'll last forever. The name Seaborgium will be in the periodic table 100 years from now, 200 uh, years, 1,000 years from now. Actually, a total of uh, 20 transuranium elements have been synthesized since that first uh, synthesis of uh, element 93 and 94 in 1940 and 41 so that now we're up to element 112. And uh, it looks like it's going to be possible as the years go on uh, to uh, synthesize and identify perhaps another half dozen uh, transuranium elements. I think this will occur uh, after I'm gone, but uh, uh, perhaps during the lifetimes of many of you, and perhaps some of you will be uh, uh, involved in the discovery of these additional transuranium elements. Seaborg is the chemist's chemist. He is so awesome on so many levels. He basically discovered almost all of the elements past uranium, all right, and during World War II, that was really important as they discovered all this stuff. Um, he got a Nobel Prize, they named an element after him. The band of stability with the islands of stability passed a little bit, out past the peninsula of instability, uh, was his idea, which is really cool. But 
What I want to talk about with Seaboard is that he started as a community college student. He had problems getting funding to go to school. He had kind of on a, on a dime and so he was able to make it in. And thank the stars because he has literally rocked a lot of these things. So all these people had to overcome a lot of things too and stuff. And being at community college is pretty cool. It was in California, not Oregon, but you get the idea. Suppose you've discovered an ancient bone amulet in an archaeological dig, and you want to know its age. You can use the rate of decay of carbon-14 to determine the artifact's age. The nucleus of a carbon-14 atom is unstable. At some time, this unstable nucleus will emit a high-energy electron called a beta particle, which has a 1 minus charge. The beta particle causes a neutron to change to a proton, and the carbon-14 atom then decays into a nitrogen-14 atom. The average time for half of a group of carbon-14 atoms to decay is 5,730 years and is called a half-life. Your bone amulet is found to contain only 12.4% of carbon-14. How old is the artifact? The level of 12.4% indicates that three half-lives have passed. Three half-lives times 5,730 years is 17,190 years old. Carbon-14 samples can be accurately dated up to 60,000 years old. Radiocarbon dating is what people used on the Shroud of Turin to tell that it maybe it wasn't the thing that covered Jesus Christ because it was made too recently. So I just want to talk about how it works, all right? Normal processes have our, we breathe in and out, we have carbon-14. As things then are buried or if people die, then the carbon-14 no longer, no, there's no more carbon-14 coming in. So the carbon-14 begins to decay. The half-life of carbon-14 is about 5,000 years. So if you measure something and it's down to half of the carbon-14 that you'd usually expect, then that would be about 5,000 years old. Now people tell me, that, oh, carbon, you know, industrial revolution, blah, blah, blah. And some of the arguments are legit, but it's important to remember that there's more than just carbon-14 out there. There's all kinds of radioactive elements where they can use this half-life dating and stuff to see what's happening. So it's a real powerful tool and stuff, and don't let people worry about it. Um, I'm out of time. I was going to show a video on in positron emission to Montreal. So radioactive um, tracers don't emit positron. That. That's it. Radioactive chemistry. Woohoo! So Friday, we're going to have some presentations. We'll do a little bit of review for the final exam. Any questions? Have a great day. Thanks for being here.